Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is Morteza Ajizadeh, your host from Critical Theory Channel. And today I'm honored to have Dr. Mary uh, Sommer with us. Uh, she's an assistant professor of history at Millersville, Millersville University, and is re- her research is focused on medieval church law and European slavery. And today she's here to talk to us about her latest our book, The Slaves of the Churches, A History, which is uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2020. Mary, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a little about yourself, introduce yourself for our listeners, and tell us about your field of research and how you became interested in the history of slavery, or let's say your main expertise is the history of church, but how did you become interested in this field? Well, um, okay. Um, my Mary Samar. Um, I was interested in studying the history of the Middle Ages. I was particularly interested in the church because it was such a big part of that time of history. And um, I ended up studying with a man who focused on church law. And I said, okay. And to my surprise, I discovered that when you study the law of a culture, you learn a whole lot about the culture because law is not what the people did. It's not even what the rulers wanted to happen. It's what the rulers thought was important to have people think they wanted. It turns out that's true today too. But um, so I learned about canon law. Church church law is, is called canon law. And I'm saying church because I studied before the Reformation when there was only one Christian church in the West. And um, about 15 years ago, I was doing another project and I stumbled across something about the church and the slaves that the church owned in the early days. And um, I was astonished. I was raised to be pious and um, my parents would be very disappointed if they were still around. But um, I couldn't imagine that, you know, I mean, being an American where slavery is a big deal, I was astonished. So I went and I asked a fella that I was working for, who was at that time sort of the most widely known scholar in the field of canon law. And um, I said, no, I can't find anything about this question. Um, Who's doing the work in this? Who would I look for? And he said, nobody is, Mary. I said, oh, and he said, I think maybe you'd better do it. So it took me 15 years to write this book because nobody had ever written anything about this question. So I had very, very little to guide me on my way. So I said, okay, I was curious. And along the way, I learned that I had been totally wrong in my first impressions. And I just kept going. And that's that's amazing. Fifteen years, yeah, it's a long time, bro. <laughs> and well, I can't either it was that. a big, deep subject, or I'm pretty slow. I, I mean, no, I no. could. <laughs> I think it's a big, big subject because there are, like you said, there are very there's the, 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 there's very little research in this area. There are, like, say, uh, articles. I remember I read an article some time ago about how the church kind of justified slavery in America only at a particular time in the. 18th century they use bible kind of to justify that like slaves need to be obedient like an obedient wife to husband and slave should be obedient to a master but never i've never seen like a book that will cover the stance of church towards slavery over a long period of time which is what you've done and i can imagine how difficult it must have been (laughs) but uh, can you so you just told us how the book came about can you tell us also about some of this the, the the kind of the scope of the research the time period you cover and why you're focus on that time period and also what were some of the sources that you used given that it was uh there was very little written on this topic well yeah thank you um yeah to 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 um talk about the time period first since i am a historian of the pre-modern period my instinct is go back to the beginning where did something begin well it turns out that slavery began back when we were living in caves which astonished me the archaeology going all the way back before, before, there is evidence that they had slaves. Astonishing. 
But where I really started to focus in was I thought, well, if you want to study slavery and Christianity, you start at the beginning of Christianity. So I thought, well, the first thing to do is look at the world in which Christianity came to be. So I went from, say, about, you know, 100 years BCE, and I followed it up through, say, the 14th, 15th century, which was a natural stopping point for two reasons. Um, for one reason, that was the period when people in Europe began reaching out to the New World, and this is a whole different area of slavery studies. And for another reason, because it's also a whole different era, era in the, um, I don't want to say system, but in the way the church regulated itself. After the Reformation, the Catholic Church began to look at things differently as well. And it's the beginning of the discussion of human rights and all that sort of thing. So it's sort of a natural stopping point. It's still an awful lot of time. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, there's very little written about slavery and the church during this period, by, written by historians. The theologians have written quite a bit, but one of the frustrations, and I should probably say this now, um, people who are not trained historians do not automatically leave their own ideas about the way the world should work when they look at people in the past. And people think this is very shocking when I say this, but it's true. The people of the ancient past thought that slavery was unfortunate, but part of life. Everybody thought that. All the saints, everybody, even in the Bible, Jesus never once said a word about negative about slavery. He even said a couple of things, I won't go into detail, but he said a couple of things that would lead you to believe that he thought, yeah, well, it's a part of life. There was a story about a slave had to do this, that, and the other thing before he could rest at night. And Jesus never said a word about the master being mean to the slave. He said, this is what a slave has to do. Well, this, is, this shocked me beyond belief. <laughs> um, but the only thing I can compare this attitude towards slavery to that moderns seem to resonate with is we live in a world where there's an enormous amount of poverty and I'm not a wealthy woman, but I'm doing fine. And I think that poverty is incredibly sad. And I try to do what little I can to, to give, you know, charitably to, to, to help people, but it's nothing. It's nothing. I suspect that in several hundred years, people will look back on our era and say how immoral we were that we let people starve to death. So I hope that sort of helps clarify what I mean when I say these people thought slavery was an unfortunate reality of life. They had not figured out anything to replace it with once capitalism and the modern job markets and all that, that, that changed. And I'm not an expert in that stuff. But so that's, that's something that um, is important to understand. And what I just did was I then I said, okay, this is what happened. This is how the Romans looked at slavery, which was it's part of life. It's too bad. Be, be nice to them, you know, do what you can for them. But you know, you need somebody to do the farming and wash your clothes and that sort of thing. Um, didn't have laundromats that the Romans could go to. Um, and the, when Christianity came along, these people all lived in the Roman Empire. They accepted the way of living that was in the empire. Some people said they would give up their slaves, not because they thought it was evil to have slaves, but because they thought it was unnecessary luxury. So it was, it was, a, it was a way of living in poverty, holy poverty is something that is very big all throughout the whole history of Christianity, people living in holy poverty. The only reason why people freed slaves back then was like people today give generously or extravagantly to help feed the hungry, house the homeless, and that sort of thing. And that, I think, is where a lot of the confusion comes in because you read these sermons 
or letters or whatever about, you know, everybody should give up their, you know, give up their slaves and live a simple life. It had nothing to do with rejecting slavery. It had to do with rejecting luxury. So you give up your slaves and you give up your jewels and you give up your fancy house. All those things were kind of the same deal. And as time went on, the people eventually in the modern era found something that they could do to make it no longer, I don't want to say necessary and I don't want to say practical, some word in between necessary and practical to have slaves, that it just was no longer the best way to go once they had a system where you could have employees and you know, the, the industrial revolution obviously was, was, you know, employees and things like that, but, you know, capitalism and um, the rise of towns, more independent craftspeople and all this allowed slavery to become no longer the center of life. My question was, well, what did the church want people to think they, the church thought of slavery? That's why I said, you know, the law is what the leaders want people to think they, they are, that the leaders are thinking. And so I followed it. And in a nutshell, for the entire first 1500 years of Christianity, the leaders of Christianity said, slavery is very unfortunate. It is, they said, it's a thing like from original sin, which does not mean you sin and you become a slave. Original sin is, a, is an ancient Christian doctrine that Human beings are not perfect. The old story of Adam eating the apple, that, but, but the, the idea is human beings are not perfect. And in a world where people aren't perfect, they sin. In a world where people aren't perfect, bad stuff naturally happens. And human beings can't be perfect. I mean, one time, once in a while, I like to think I am, but someone of my relatives generally tells me that's wrong. I'm not. Makes it very clear. But so when you people read the, the ancient documents about slavery as the result of sin, it's the result of sin in the same way that influenza is, or poverty, or droughts, or whatever. And so that that is confusing to the modern reader, because unless you've been trained for a long time to read in the mindset of the people who, was write, people who were writing these documents... You can easily misinterpret them if you're using modern sensibilities. And slaves were, they were the labor force. And it was perfectly okay. It, it soon became the practice that you would never enslave everybody, anybody who was like yourself. So if you had a war, you could enslave them. Prisoners of war couldn't work. Well, we kind of still do that in some places. Um, we enslave prisoners in this country. I don't know if they do all over, but in until very recently, most prisoners in the U.S. had jobs in the prison. Now they get paid a little bit for doing it. Not much, but they, you know, a token thing in most places. But it's so they decided it was okay to enslave people unless they were like like me, like like us, whoever us happened to be. Uh, so it could be prisoners of war. It could be people of another religion because this was an era where there was no tolerance for other religions. So if you weren't a Christian, you were fair game. It wasn't okay to, to enslave Christians. They decided it wasn't okay to enslave Christians because Christians are like us. It's only okay to enslave the, the other. And we could go into a big psychosocial analysis of why that's so, but that's not my expertise, and we'd only, only have a few more minutes anyway. But... Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what the book shows, how these ideas progressed over the years and looks at the various social societal structures that evolved to deal with the stuff. I'll shut up now. Oh, no, that was actually an excellent kind of an overview of the book and the general attitude of the people towards slavery or the attitude general, I'd say, of the church maybe. Or, But we'll get into some more details on that. Uh, chapter two of your book, you, 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 you demonstrate that the Christ followers do very little to condemn slavery. Is there anything specific in the New Testament? Or what was the position of the New Testament towards the slavery? The New Testament had absolutely no position about slaves. 
It was a non-issue. It was they. It was you know they had no position about doorknobs either. It was just part of life. You should you you know you you should not destroy your doorknob and you should be nice to your slaves, but not that nice. Mm. <laughs> so it's completely taken for granted that it's a normal part of life. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there are two um, two kind of terms. I, I could be mis. I mean, I'm sure I'll, I'll be mispronouncing them. So you correct me, <laughs> please. So it would be great if you could explain what they are and also what they mean. And also what was the position of the early church fathers on slavery? Did they have anything to say on that? And the terms are uh, res ecclesias. I, the Latin terms I could be mispronouncing. Res ecclesia. Like, it's simply yeah. a Latin term for property of the church. Property Rates of the church. Yeah. And the things other one the... is servi ecclesi. Well, ecclesia. servi is the Latin word for slave. Mm. And it, the, the, the plural ending is ecclesiarum. Oh, I see. So it's uh, properties of the church. Yes, so the properties of the church and yeah. slaves of the church. Mm. So, and what now, was uh, the position of the early church fathers on slavery? They didn't have a particular position on slavery. They thought it was a perfectly normal part of life. It was an unfortunate thing for the people who were enslaved. People who were like us, whoever us was, um, were not really eligible to be enslaved. But it was part of life. They did distinguish, though, between slaves and new captives. They recognized that when you were first a captive, you had not yet accepted your slavery and it had not yet had that effect on your psyche that you were now an object to other people. And if you had not gone through that, you should either give these people time to do that or... If you were newly captured, it was encouraged to go rescue the person before that happened to them. So they did acknowledge there was a, a, a transition period where you were neither slave nor free, if you will, psychologically. Physically, you were not free, but psychologically, you hadn't yet become a slave. And, and when did the ecclesiastical corporate ownership of slaves people take place? And what was it like? Well, that's... What I hope to find out, and you know, there's there's no um, there's no firm answer to that. What I learned is that everybody who wasn't dirt poor had at least a couple of slaves. So Christians had slaves for the most part, unless they were really poor, couldn't afford them, but everybody else had them. And Christian leaders, as in our society today, religious leaders, leaders in society, generally come from a slightly more privileged background, not necessarily super rich, but that they have the resources that they don't have to, you know, go out and scramble for their food every day. They can think about organizational things. So they would have slaves. And then once Christianity became legal and the groups of Christians could form a corporation, Actually, the word, the concept of corporation was the same as it is now. Then the corporation would have some slaves to run the clubhouse, as you, the, the church, the meeting place, the, to keep it clean, to do this or that, to, to do errands for the various people who work for the church. So there was no position. You should treat your slaves well. Not everybody did. When you didn't treat your slaves well, you were disapproved of usually. Um, one of the, the things that was a great concern is that typically in the ancient world, you could use your slaves sexually, perfectly normal thing for people to do. However, the people got very upset when the clergy used their slaves sexually because Christianity taught that any sexual activity outside of Christian marriage one-on-one -on -one forever was wrong. So they got very upset about having slave girls in monasteries because the monks had taken a vow of celibacy and then there were all these slave girls around and, you know, there was chaos. But there, uh, there was no position on slavery. It would be like the church today having a position on dishwashers. I think that it sounds heartless, into, but... The, yeah, <laughs> uh, that puts it into perspective. <laughs> and... and uh, in the fourth century, they had this legislation of Christianity by Constantine. Did it make any change in the practice? Did it, I mean, what role did it play, or did it normalize the practice of slavery in the no, church? No, not at all. Other than 
since Christianity was now officially legal, these corporations could be legal corporations. But it had nothing to do with slavery any more than it had, it had to do with the kind of dishes that they used for their banquets. I know this sounds very heartless, but that's really the way these people thought about it. And, and you also talk about uh, <clears throat> uh, Gregory of Nyssa. And what was his position well, on slavery? His position, he's a lot of people who've written reviews of this book have been very angry that I did not <laughs> praise him for being an abolitionist. He was not an abolitionist. Mm. Because he's usually it's, thought to be kind of an abolitionist in general. Yeah, he wasn't. Yeah. They, they, the, 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 he was somebody who thought, and I'm sorry if I sound arrogant, I don't mean to. He was somebody who thought that you should be nice to your slaves. And he also was somebody who was at the school of thought. And he got this from his teacher. And he belonged to a group of friends, all bishops. They were all bishops, these fellas. And they all thought the same way. You shouldn't have any more slaves than were absolutely necessary. Gregory of Nyssa owned slaves. He thought you treat them well and you don't have any more than you need because that's um, conspicuous wealth is, is not good for one's soul. And he, he, he preached a very famous sermon and it's on a passage from Ecclesiastes, which in the interest of time, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, but in, in, in Ecclesiastic, the writer is saying, you know, I got all this stuff and I got houses and this and that and slaves and all the da, 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 da. And what good did any of it do me? The, the houses were no good. The, the, the slaves were no good. The jeweler is no good. Everything of this worldly wealth is vanity was the, is the word that it's translated in, in English into. So a lot of people only pick up on the little snippet where he says, slaves, you know, didn't do me any good. They have no value. I should, we should get rid of our slaves. We shouldn't have too many slaves. He didn't say you should never have a slave. He said in another writing, you know, or either he did or another one of his, his fellows in this group, they said, why would you have 10 slaves to help you take a bath? You can take a bath yourself pretty well. Save your slaves for where you need slave labor, sort of thing. So Gregory of Nyssa, um, and I, I read a lot, lot of what people had written about him, and then I went and I read everything he wrote, which took a long time. Um, some of it I skimmed. But <laughs> he never once said slavery is sinful. He said having too many slaves is sinful, as... Today, you would say having too many Maseratis is sinful. And so he, he had a couple himself, only a couple. His family, his friends, all, you know, th these people wanted a few slaves because they wanted to live a simple life. Yeah, yeah. It was part kind of his of philosophy, life. but not really against No, it had nothing to do with, and, you know, slaves, slaves deserve to be treated well. They are human beings. And what he didn't say was they got a lousy lot in life. We should feel sorry for them. But that was kind of what was in his mind, as mm. far as I can tell. Mm. Sorry, it's just not that sensational. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but it's good to know about that, because like you said, normally people take him to be, well, you know, abolitionist in the modern sense, anyhow, but as you mentioned, it's just that, yeah, don't have too many. Just treat them nice. A couple is enough. <laughs> well, most theologians aren't trained historians. Mm. I'm mm. a historian. I'm not a theologian mm. <laughs> by any means. <laughs> but um, it's easy to think that if you read his stuff without going really deep. Mm. And I'll tell you, I probably spent about six months on Gregory of Nyssa. Ooh. And you said that you went through all his work, right? Yeah, well, I <laughs> want to make sure, you know? <laughs> how about Augustine, St. Augustine? I couldn't find he said anything in particular other than he thought that monks shouldn't have a lot of worldly possessions. So if you wanted to be a monk and live in his monastery, you had to leave your slaves home. Hmm. It wasn't about the slavery. It was the living simply. And uh, you also talk about... Um, but uh, again, I can't. I might. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be mispronouncing this term again. My uh, manumisio, uh, which is Man like manumisio. That's yeah. just the, 
the Latin word for um, giving someone their freedom. Manumission would be the English translation. When, and man, he... manumission in Ecclesia, manumission that took place in the church, that's kind of a weird thing that happened. What this was about was, um, I, I don't quite know as much as I'd like to know about this. And, and when my life comes down, I'm going to look at it a little more closely. But when Christianity became legal, as was the custom in many parts of the Roman Empire, um, community leaders took on judicial functions. In Christian communities, bishops were community leaders, and they took on judicial functions. Therefore, instead of taking your slave to the judge to get free, to give him freedom, you could take your slave to the bishop to get freedom. But somehow, and nobody seems to be clear on this, somehow, in many cases, when a slave got its freedom in the church, instead of, which was the universal custom, and it was benefited both sides of the party, if you freed your slave, you were not, you couldn't just kick them out to the street. You had to take care of them and get them integrated into society. And in return for that, they owed you certain duties. And this relation, and if you died, your son would owe the duties. If he died until both generations were dead, that were involved in the original transaction, there was this relationship that was more for the slave's benefit, I think, than for the for the former owner's benefit, because the slave had a patron to represent him in society. I mean, if he'd been a captive from some God only knows where place, it was it was it was not a bad thing at all. I'm sure there were bad situations, but the the, the institution was not bad. Somehow, a lot of slaves who were given their freedom in the church, instead of those obligations be, being between the slave and the former master, the obligations became between the slave and the church. And I've never been able to figure out how that happened. I don't think anybody has yet. Um, so again, this bond was supposed to continue until both parties to the original transaction were dead. There's the problem. The church is merely the, um, if you will, the office of God. The church itself doesn't own anything. Anything that the church acts as manager for is actually the property of God. This is deep legal reasoning here. So the church building belongs to God and so forth and so on. And the thing is that God doesn't die. So that relationship can never end because one party to the transaction will never die. It's impractical. They tried to work it out. They tried all sorts of solutions over the years, but they never really came up with a solution that logic and law made possible. It just sort of became so impractical that it kind of fizzled out as a, as a custom. So they were sort of free, but at the same time, not completely free because they still had these obligations. Well, yeah. And the, the thing is, it started out where there were two people, you know, say two adult men who would live another 20, 30 years. And when the first one died, his son would take over that until the second one died or daughter if they didn't have sons. And that makes perfect sense in a world where you needed a protector if you were not a, a, you know, if you were a vulnerable person. Having a protector was so advantageous, you would gladly do service. The difficulty is that if your protector is God, your great grandchildren could be the ones in the art in the thing because God's still there in the view of the people who were doing all of this. So it it sounds like it's a horribly cruel thing, and it was in fact, but it wasn't supposed to be. And they just couldn't figure out, the, the lawyers couldn't figure out a way to get out of the, of the thing. And then, like I said, they just kind of, they just kind of let it disappear. <laughs> and how about the legal reform in the time, in the time of uh, Charlemagne's empire? Did it have any impact on the practice of slavery? I'm sorry, but no. What Charlemagne did was he conquered a whole lot of land. So he did legal reform so that everybody be doing the things the way he wanted he did not change the way his people, the Franks, did things. He changed the way some of the people he conquered did things because they had to change everything to do it his way. Charlemagne was allied with the church because that's how he came to power to begin with. 
was the church was on his side and that gave him access to power. Much as in the modern world, when religious leaders back you up, you get votes. Um, so Charlemagne had a lot of policies that were kind of thank yous to the church. But as far as the institution of slavery and how you dealt with all of that, nothing of any significance changed. Excepting in the places where he conquered, where they had totally different customs. But that was what happened. That's what happened when you get conquered. Uh and, and how about the law regarding the marriage of slaves? Did they? That I think is a really interesting question, and I suspect that this is where the the first crack into accepting slavery as as a custom in human society. Maybe that's where it came in, because the only beings who can marry are human beings. You have to be a legal person to get married. Standard everywhere. And slaves were not legal persons. However, the Christians were very upset about the issue of slavery and um, relations between men and women. They taught you can only have sexual relations with your legal spouse. So they kind of allowed slaves to get married in church because they figured it was better to let them get married, even though they weren't legal persons, than to let them carry on, as it were, without the benefit of marriage. But the problem is the fact that they did have marriage contracts and the fact that they did sometimes litigate the consequences of that meant, oh, they're people, they're legally people. So they, they kept coming, the, the church kept coming up with, and the secular rulers too in, in Western Christendom, came up with, with situational fixes for what was going on. But the difficulty was the, the sort of background thing is we're letting them enter into contracts, just like a corporation is a legal person. Well, slaves are legal people and they're people sometimes and they're not people other times. And that became a little bit uncomfortable, I think. I don't know yet that that actually led to anything, but it seems to have led to a lot of customs that led to eventually. I mean, we're talking 2000 years here, you know, we're not, it was, it, it's hard to, to put it in a nutshell in a half an hour. Uh, thanks. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and uh, can you talk about because in part of your book you talk about mass migration of Bologna's exploration of laws regarding slavery, and then you talk about the the way the classical canon law moves into the church law of the 12th century. Can you talk about that part, please? Sure. Um, what happened in the 12th century was a revolution in the way scholars looked at scholarship, including law. And Master Gratian was, well, we're not 100% sure, but most people think he was a law professor at the brand new University of Bologna, first university in Europe. And he left behind a long document that is organized in a rather peculiar way. And there's, it's not a book with a thesis from front to back. It's sections with this, 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 and this, and this hap are laws, and this is what I think of them sort of thing. But he did not condemn slavery any more than anybody else in that period did. Um, he presented both sides of the story. And he uh, came down with, with, with his, his bottom line was what I've been saying all along. Slaves are people, Christian people, treat them decently, they should be allowed to marry, but they were also the property of the church if they were church slaves. And it was the important to protect the property of the church, the res ecclesiae. A lot of people criticize houses of worship in all denominations now because they have money. Well, the people who work there need to get paid because they need to eat and feed their kids. And they need to keep the roof repaired and that sort of thing. And as long as it wasn't, isn't crazy, um, 
not to defend Christianity or any other religion that has ancient temples. Um, those buildings cost a lot to keep up, but it's still cheaper than knocking them down and building something new. <laughs> you know, they, they, the, the church has expenses in order to function as an organization. And slaves were one of the expenses of a church in an era where they didn't have, you know, a, a, a maid service that you could call up and hire somebody to come in and clean your whatever the way we do now in most countries, most Western countries, including your you, your Western country, aren't you? Uh, yeah, um, if you consider Australia West, it's an extension of the West, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a result of colonialism, just like yeah, the United that's States. Right. Is. Yeah. <laughs> All of us formal colonies, we stick yeah. together. Um, so a lot of the law that, that Gratian said, okay, well, there's all these laws say this, and there's all these other laws say that, but if you analyze them, it comes down to this seems to be the principle you have to pay attention to. That, that's what his, it was a textbook for law students, basically, how to argue cases. And on all the questions of, of church slavery, he didn't change. He, you know, this whole idea of you, you free the slaves of the church, but the church is continues to be the slave's patron, you know, acting on behalf of God until God dies, at which time the church will no longer be the slave's patron. Um, of course, the, God can't die, so that, that means forever. Um, you could sometimes, he figured, he found some stuff that led him to conclude there were sufficient precedents to permit that if the, 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 the rector, the pastor of a given congregation purchased the slaves with his own funds, thereby making sure that the church did not lose financially, then the rector could, the, the, the pastor could free the slaves because he would have purchased them, keeping the church financially on the same level, and then he could then set them free. He was, he was permitted to set his own personal slaves free, but he had to pay for them before he could set them free. And oddly enough, that was a huge advance. But other than that, I mean, this, this is a law book. It's lawyers. Laws, lawyers mostly deal with property. And slaves were property. Then, you know, you, if you wanted to butcher one of the cows that belonged to the church, unless it was for a church supper, you had to pay the church for the cow. And legally, slaves weren't much different from cows, which I hate saying that out loud because, it, I, it, you know, that, that's not who I am as a person, but I'm reporting what happened. So all of these periods in the church, I know, I know you're sitting here and you're thinking, Basically, she says nothing changed through all these hundreds of years. And that, yeah, and I looked in every corner. I looked at, I think I probably read 10,000 pages of ancient legal documents. And Lord knows how many books. And there's no bibliography at the end of my book because it would have been another book. So I took 15 years because I thought, I really want to know the answer. I'm not trying to grind out a book. I want I care about the answer to the question. If a book comes, that's great. But I want to know what the deal was. And the deal was nothing changed. Nothing changed. And I know your next question is, what about the modern church? Nothing yeah, changed. Sure. Nothing, nothing much changed towards the... Nothing changed until... As best as I can figure out, what happened was as various political areas outlawed slavery, the church could no longer own slaves in that political area, in that country. So the church stopped having slaves in most places in the late 18th, 19th centuries, as one by one various countries outlawed slavery. Well, couldn't have slaves anymore. And... I don't want to make up stuff, but apparently they got used to it. Um, they, they, they don't have slaves anymore anywhere. And it wasn't until the late 19th century, I mean, up into the 19th century, the, the church owned slaves. The Pope owned slaves in Rome. The Pope was, you know, independent and it was, wasn't outlawed. So, you know, he, he, everybody owned slaves. In um, 
a very famous document in 1891, Pope Leo XIII, wrote a a, a document about the dignity of working people. And a lot of people look to that as a positive anti-slavery position. For the, no, it wasn't. It wasn't about slavery. It was the dignity of anybody who works for a living. Slaves too. <laughs> they work for a living. They work to be able to eat and sleep in the bed the master provided, but it was not anti-slavery. And in 1917, the church totally revised the code of canon law that went all the way back to around the year 1600. They finally, around 1600, they finally codified, okay, these are the laws. It's not just a bunch of law books and people's opinions. It's these, this is it. This is the deal. And from 1600 to 1917, they never really changed it. 1917 code upheld all the earlier laws about slavery, none of which forbade slavery, except against particular situations where it would not have been appropriate to do this, that, or the other thing. But slavery as a concept was not outlawed at all. In 1992, they, the church published a catechism, a, a book of this is what we believe. It wasn't an official law code, but it was the, for the average member of the faithful, you know, this is what we believe. And a lot of people were very surprised to learn that this book was, um, it, it, it was a huge job. And the whole thing was supervised by Cardinal Ratzinger, who was Pope Benedict XIII, who is recently deceased. And he was known for being incredibly conservative. Um, at the time, the Pope was John Paul II. Um, and it was, you know, his name was on it, but it was really Cardinal Ratzinger who, who did the whole thing. And this book, this catechism, this, this book of this is what Christians believe, what Catholics believe, said, if you enslave someone, you are guilty of the sin of theft because you have, sold, you have stolen their personhood, which I think that's pretty much what we think now. You, know, you, you, you can't be a slave. You can't make somebody your slave because you are stealing their freedom and that's what this, this catechism in 1992 was the first you can't, slavery. If you make someone a slave, you've committed a sin. It's the first time in 1992. Um, there were no apologies for, for former slave owning. Um, but the recent trip of Pope um, Francis to Canada was an apology for the church schools that they forced the indigenous children into in order to try to stamp out the, 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 the settlers were trying to stamp out the indigenous culture. That, that was something very different. But there was no absolute slavery as a sin period until this 1992 catechism, despite the famous Vatican II Council in the early 1960s, where there were lots of things that made it sound like nobody there thought slavery was okay, but we're not going to come right out and say it in so many words. And despite um, a new revised code of canon law in 1983, still ambiguous. Nobody wanted to, you know, they, nobody wanted to say it. But finally, of all people, this ultra conservative Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, God bless him. He's the one who said it. Not at all what you think. So I'm sure that now your understanding of everything that I've been talking about is as clear as mud because it's just not a clear issue. Yeah, yeah. It's a complicated history, as you mentioned, and um, well, now I better understand why you spent like fifteen years researching this book. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's a long and it's a long period of time that you cover lack of resources. Uh, these are all the things that make it even more challenging. Yeah, I mean, I read tons and tons of things that other people wrote, but nobody ever wrote about my question. Most times when historians do research, somebody else has written a book on it or somebody's written a bunch of articles on it or something, and you can you have somebody's point of view to bounce off. But just as way back when, when um, Professor Landau, that I was working for, I lived in Munich at the time, said, well, nobody's written on this, Mary, maybe you should. He was right. Nobody had written on this. I would have found it. I had resources on both sides of the ocean helping me, and uh, I haven't even begun to answer the question. But at least I now know there's not going to be an easy answer. And that took 15 years. <laughs> but this is a valuable source of uh, information 
which could start new avenues for research. Um, just if 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 there are more resources available, but I guess it's uh, it's more or less an archival research as well. You need to find like yeah, like you did go with church documents, legal documents, uh, local history, the particular place maybe. Yeah, it's not an easy task. <laughs> no, it's not, and I think that one of the reasons why the task is made so difficult is that up until really quite recently in human history, slaves were just not that interesting. People didn't write about them any more than they wrote about the the, the, the dinner dishes, you know. <laughs> they were part of the equipment of a household. Yeah, so nobody really and, cared that much. <laughs> which is a horrible thing. It, to us, you know, thank God we're enlightened. And that's why I use the, the, the comparison with poverty. I truly hope that in three or 400 years, people look at our world and say how horrible they were, but we can't figure out a way to fix it. So basically what I learned is, I don't know. (laughs) Dr. Mary Sommer, thank you very much uh, for sharing your thoughts on New Books Network. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it.